Good morning, everybody. Thanks for hopping on this document. I'm obviously gone because of girls golf sectionals. It's really, really important that you actually listen to this video as you watch it, because I'm going to tell you at times to pause it, do some work, and then come back and resume like I'm about to do with your start of class right here. Uh, to begin, you should see on your lesson a little activity start a class thing going over two very famous Chinese philosophies and ways of thought uh, with how people should live their lives. Uh, they're called Confucianism and Taoism. What you're going to attempt to do with subjects that can be a little complicated is try to get a working definition, a working summary in three sentences each for uh, both Confucianism and Taoism, which you should see a slot for on your lesson. And then a sentence or two at the end when you're done with the activity saying how are they different. You have three links, the graphic organizer chart things are really helpful. I believe you have some slides as well. So what I want you to do is pause this video right now and then work on this, try to fill out those answers. And then when you're ready for summary slide, either reload the video or come back and resume this and come back and get the teaching from the summary slide. When you're doing notes on Screencastify, when you're ready for it, I would highly recommend doing like split screen or something like that. So you don't have to hop back and forth constantly between the video notes that I'm showing uh, and your Google Doc. At this point, if you're at this part of the video, you should be done with the Confucianism versus Taoism little mini activity, and you're ready for some general teaching from me. Uh, to help break down what the work you just saw and maybe wrote down and tried to figure out on your own, this is me kind of coming back the way I did with Hinduism and Buddhism and giving you a little breakdown on each. Confucianism is all about relationships. Uh, all about positive relationships and more specifically relationships with family and the government that rules over you. So Confucianism promotes good government equals loyalty and duty and something called filial piety, which is the idea. And I would say there is a culture of this still in China today of loyalty to family, respect for elders and those that are in charge of you. And if you build this government, family, respect for elders, you will have a good society, you will have harmony. Now, Taoism, you might think of it sort of like Buddhism a little bit, I suppose. It is not really focused on society and government and big population kind of thinking. It's more focused on just self and the individual. The way of virtue is the name of its teachings and the whole concept behind it, similar to Buddhism, as I mentioned, is to be at peace with nature and earth. Also, obviously, there is a pause button. Shoot, maybe you put me on 1.25, 1.5 if you feel like you can handle it. So if I click on into the video, just go back or pause it to get your notes. Now, you're going to take some stuff down on the Qin Dynasty here. I'll try to, I guess, I'll put my face over this guy's face uh, so you can see the notes. Get these down uh, working together as a group. Or, excuse me, you're not working together as a group. You're doing this on your own. Uh, you can recall the last time you saw me in person, uh, the Zhou Dynasty went through a slow, painful decline uh, called the period of the Warring States, which was a time period where China was very fragmented. We talked a lot about unity and fragmentation the last time you took notes. Okay, As different states in China fought, they started to take each other over. And there was a lot of back and forth with who's in charge. The Qin, as I almost spilled my coffee, ended up winning and unified China again under their rule. Now, their first emperor, and sometimes considered the first true emperor of China, is a guy by the name of Qin Shi Huang, who is, uh, whose name literally means first emperor. And he is very authoritative and uses brutal tactics uh, to keep order in the Qin dynasty. More on that in a second. Again, I'm going too fast. Just press the pause button and fill in your notes. Huang standardized the empire. Okay, what that means is he kind of puts it all under his control. No more warring states. I'm going to run things through my Qin dynasty, and we're going to kind of have control from the top down. He abolished the former states that were split up and warring with each other and created military districts or military zones that were strictly regulated. 
He did extend roads, not him himself, but under his leadership, extended roads and repaired canals. Another big thing, and I think a lot of it's actually destroyed today, not part of the current Great Wall of China, but they are credited, or the Qin Dynasty is credited with building the very first portions of the Great Wall of China, which is still a massive tourist attraction to this day. The Qin Dynasty, especially Shi, uh, Qin Shi Huang, almost got his name screwed up there, uh, they ruled through something called legalism. Legalism is a philosophy of ruling. Maybe it's a philosophy that some of your high school teachers have, but it's the thought that people are naturally bad. It's the thought that people are naturally evil and greedy. So therefore, I'll back up here a little bit. Therefore, leadership or the government should be strict and oppressive as well because you can't trust the people you are in charge of. So legalism in simple terms basically means we have to be strict. We have to have lots of punishments. We have to run things like a, like a drill sergeant in the military or people will rebel against us. It goes completely against the ideas of Confucianism, which say that people will follow good leaders and flee piety and relationships and all of that. Okay, And Chen Shi Huang made legalism the official policy of the Qin dynasty. So the Qin were known as pretty strict and sometimes even oppressive. No bullets coming up on this. You just got the whole slide at once. Legalism basically says order and control comes from being strict and having harsh punishments. So the best analogy I can give you is a teacher that can't, controls their classroom, maybe not through fun activities or getting to know the kids. You might have a few of these on your schedule right now, but more have control through being strict day in, day out, and you know you, you, you can't get away with even the, the smallest infraction in their classroom. Uh, for example, uh, to keep uh, knowledge suppressed, Qin Dynasty would sometimes burn books. They also would jail. You can think of the Assyrians maybe here a little bit. Excuse me. They would jail, torture, kill, and enslave dissenters, which is a fancy way of saying anyone that would oppose them or threaten their rule as the Qin Dynasty. Later dynasties, as you might expect, absolutely despised legalism because they found it oppressive. And they more or less wanted to embrace Confucianism, which was a more uh, digestible and appealing form of ruling with government to the people. After Chen Shi Huang died, revolts broke out in China and they went back to being fragmented. It's okay if you Google a little bit. This name's interesting. Lu Bang, the story goes, who is a peasant that wasn't able to read at the bottom of their social class, climbed the ladder in this era of fragmentation, claimed the mandate of heaven, and is the original founder pictured here of what we know as the very, very important to Chinese history, the Han Dynasty. I won't make you watch this video through a screencastify. What I do need you to do now is at the front of the room, maybe on the podium or black chair or in front of the markers, it will be obvious. You need to get a piece of paper, which actually, shoot, I might just grab one so you can see what it looks like right now. Uh, there's a, uh, a sheet that's like a one through 10. And then this will be for next class, not today. There's a dragon on the back. That might be how to find it. You need this piece of paper. Uh, you can see stuff hanging up around the room. It's different pictures from the Han Dynasty. Now, the thing is, I know it's weird with the sub. You may not want to get up and just start walking around randomly. So in your lesson, you have the exact same pictures that are taped up around the room for you to just, you can stay at your desk, just scroll through them, read the captions. Uh, what you will do, here's the digital version of this task, is whether you get up or stay at your seat to look at these pictures, you're going to write down 10 things, 10 achievements that you notice from the Han Dynasty. You must have one thing from each of the seven pictures or boxes, captions, whatever you want to call it. And then eight, nine, and 10, you can have basically three of the seven that you pull multiple achievements from so you can get to 10. To close out your work, 
you need to fill in this box, which is like a reflection, please make sure you write actually four to five sentences. And again, like I said, when I was showing the paper, tiny dynasty activity, that's for next class, not today. You need a link for it that you don't even have yet. Don't worry about it. If you need something else to do potentially, the one thing I would remind you is if you didn't get your paragraph done last class for points in Canvas, comparing ancient China which with ancient India, I would do that as well after you finish your Han Dynasty uh, legacy and achievements walk. Email me if you have any serious questions. Please be respectful to the sub at all times. And I will see you guys again on Wednesday.